All right, well, thank you all for uh, joining us this morning. Uh, today I'm going to discuss uh, insect pest management in processing vegetables. Uh, first, I'm going to start with, uh, with seed corn maggot. Uh, let's see here, there we go. Uh, seed corn maggot is an early season pest. It prefers cool, wet conditions, and it really likes fields with recent organic matter amendments, either tilling in a cover crop or manure application. Uh, it, it's, it's essentially a, a detritivore, so it feeds on just decaying organic matter in the soil, but it will go after um, actively growing tissue like seedlings. Uh, seed corn maggots peak first generation flight occurs right around 360 degree days with a base temperature of uh, 39 degrees. Uh, hang on, let's, let's see here. There we go. Uh, the uh, the second generation peaks right around 1,080 degree days. So the first generation can occur. The first peak flight uh, can occur anywhere from late March to early April. The second peak is typically sometime around the second week of May. Uh, and the reason why the these are important um, degree days. Uh, is because we can escape windows uh, where we're not going to have seed corn maggot activity. This is a slide from Brian Nault. Uh, he's an entomologist at Cornell. And in his 2018 seed corn maggot trials, he planted, uh, I believe these were, uh, yes, these are peas. He planted peas every two weeks in May. And you can see only one of his planting dates had significant um, seed corn maggot pressure the other planting dates had virtually none. And that just uh, reinforces this. This pest is very degree day um, specific, you know, within, you know, plus or minus some, some time, but it just goes to show that there are time periods in which we can escape seed corn maggot pressure. So when, um, so I've got an interest in doing seed corn maggot trials primarily because seed corn maggot is controlled solely by seed treatments, uh, Lohr's band and Cruiser. Lohr's band's fate is in constant limbo. Uh, the EPA has released some proposed um, interim decisions on chlorpyrifos' uh, status as an active ingredient. And they're really looking to eliminate all uses, save a couple. One of the uses that uh, they highlighted as, as being worth keeping is as a seed treatment and also as a, um, a bark application to peaches for protection against peach tree borer. Uh, but those are just pre preliminary um, decisions. They're not finalized. There's also hard lobbying at the state and the federal level against neonicotinoids in all uses. Um, so it, looking forward, I'm interested in looking at for alternatives besides these two in case we lose any of our management options. So the way we do this is we spike our trials. Uh, we add manure um, in both 2018, 2019, and 2020. We added manure between four and six tons to the acre. Uh, we till in fallow ground. Uh, we did this last year in 2020. Um, and we will also spread dog food on top of the plots. We did this in all three years. And the, the reason for that is it just, um, it's kind of what has been done, spreading bone and meat meal. Uh, our source of meat meal dried up and uh, meat meal is used in pet food. And again, it just, it, it makes this field super attractive to uh, flies. Last year, our weather was absolutely perfect. We spread the manure at peak flight uh, as predicted by degree days. And then we planted about six days later. So we're planting into like first instar maggots or, or eggs. And then at the very end of March, uh, the weather cooled down. One thing I want to point out is this past year, we planted March 16th. This is three weeks earlier than in 2018 or 2019. And that's because February and March were so warm. In 2019, our seed corn maggot trial we had less cotyledon damage in our cruiser treated plots, but the plants themselves did not appear to be greatly affected. 
And this is something that Brian Nolt also observed. And it's led to some speculation that peas are very tolerant of seed corn maggot, especially under low to moderate conditions. However, neither of us took uh, our moderate injury trials to yield. So that was the goal for 2020 was to take this trial to yield. Uh, in 2020, um, our peas were planted a little bit deep. Uh, this is uh, uh, something that Emily also pointed out. Uh, and we just had phenomenal seed corn maggot pressure. Uh, they wiped out the untreated check plot. And so I did not need to take that uh, plot to yield. Up here, you can see uh, in this picture, the influence of planting date and seed corn maggot damage. Um, these seedlings are all kind of arranged at roughly the same uh, respective level to the soil line. And you can see this one seedling right here that was really shallow planted. It, it's, it's growing. Um, the taproot has been destroyed by seed corn maggot, but the, the plant itself at least had a, has a chance. Um, this other seedling right here, it had a green stem and died. And the rest of them, the maggots either destroyed the cotyledons completely or destroyed the stems underground. Taking a look at our stand counts in 24 row feet, uh, I had diazinon in as a treatment as kind of an old standard. It is no longer labeled for this use. Uh, our seed treatments, Cruiser and Lohr's ban, uh, they had some protection against seed corn maggot, but seed corn maggot will, will overwhelm a seed treatment if it's in high enough uh, populations. Uh, for Tenza and um, Entrust, those were treated by Dr. Alan Taylor. They are not labeled for seed corn maggot, but we are working with IR4 to get some data to hopefully get an approval for one or both of these uh, seed treatments for seed corn maggot protection in legume crops. Uh, for Tenza is cyantranilipril, that's a diamide, and trust is spinosad. And when that, uh, that uh, next generation peak flight occurred, this is what the plots ended up looking like. All these little black spots on the soil surface, those are adult seed corn maggots. Uh, this, this field was just covered in them. It was, uh, what I consider a glorious infestation. Uh, next up, I'm going to discuss uh, some considerations with sweet corn pest management, um, with particular emphasis on the ear pests. We've got earworms, armyworms, uh, stink bugs, sap beetles, and aphids. Uh, sap beetles, the only thing I'm going to mention about them is they start coming into fields at right at full silk, and they really prefer worm damaged plants. So if the, if the planting has worm damage in it, that's where the sap beetles concentrate themselves. All right, I showed this slide yesterday. Um, I'm going to focus primarily here on this blue box. This is the box of uh, insecticides that we have to protect ears against worms. Uh, we're, we're very limited on our modes of action. We've got pyrethroids and diamides and uh, spinosin. Uh, radiant, the spinosin class, has been inconsistent when applied by itself. It is best either inside of a rotation or as a tank mix. I'm going to touch on that here in just a moment. With fall armyworm, we've got a couple of additional products <clears throat> that are labeled for whirl feeding worms, not necessarily for silking stage. This one product, Ryman, down here at the bottom, I've got that italicized. It's labeled for both uh, whorl and silk stage protection. Uh, the, to my knowledge, it has not yet been evaluated in the mid-Atlantic for silk stage uh, protection against earworms or armyworms. So this past year, we had armyworms show up in mid-July and August, uh, spotty whorl stage infestations. Some fields were treated for this. Um, it, this, is a, this is a pest that uh, we've got very high thresholds for, at least in the mid world stage. But when we start pushing tassel, we need to be really careful that we're not pushing worms out with that tassel, because if they get pushed out, they will go to the ear and hit the side of the ear. Uh, especially later on in the summer, um, I 
I do not recommend using a diamide um, against uh, world stage infestations. And the reason for that is chlorantranilaprol, either in Corrigin, Besiege, or Elevest, on its label, we can only make three applications before we run up against its maximum active ingredient use per field, per season. And so I want to keep that active ingredient around for silk stage protection. And I'm going to touch on that here in just a moment. So when we scout for fall armyworm, you want to look for recent window panes or really small holes. But this worm moves in very deep into the whorls. By the time we see a lot of feeding damage, most of the time that larvae has completed its development and has already left the plant. And you can see that in all three of these pictures. Here on the bottom left is a uh, whorl where the uh, folded up leaves do not have any feeding damage on them. Uh, again, that's, that's from a worm that finished up and left. Uh, same with this one. This one might actually still have a fall army room in it here in the middle, uh, but that's going to be a very old army worm. You can see it's already done extensive feeding. Same with uh, this whorl here on the right. So by the time we see eye catching damage, a lot of the time those worms have already left, but be watching this field for the emerging tassel because just because a lot of the worms have already left does not mean that we don't still have moths laying eggs in the field. What you don't wanna see is small window painting like this on the husk leaves, egg masses on leaves right at or after tassel push. Uh, and what happens is you get a, uh, an army worm that will drill in through the side of the ear and uh, it can per cause problems like this where the whole one side of the ear was not pollinated because the silks were destroyed uh, right before uh, pollination happened. So we've got, um, we use thresholds uh, that are slightly different from uh, some other states. Um, our thresholds are a little bit more conservative. Uh, what I wanna mention about trapping is that Traps really need to be close or as close to silking sweet corn as possible because sweet corn is highly attractive to moths. So if you have a trap that's located, you know, even a uh, relatively short distance away, but not near sweet corn, it's going to capture a different um, moth count. When the temperature is over 82 degrees or so, it takes earworm eggs shorter amount of time to hatch. And so, especially in high pressure situations, we really need to tighten our spray intervals by a day, um, especially during the first 10 days of silking to account for that quicker development. Earworm management is uh, rather difficult. Uh, and that's in part because we do have uh, pyrethroid resistance. In 2019, we tested moths for pyrethroid resistance. And you can see the season started out fairly low, uh, around 15% resistance. But by mid-July, it increased up into the upper 40, 45% or so. In 2020, we started, it wasn't as clear of a pattern. We started up with, uh, with more resistance in our moths. And I believe that's because of our mild winter, allowing more of these fairly puny but resistant moths to survive winter. They, they're, not as, they're not as robust of a moth. They're not as a healthy of a moth when there is no pyrethroids to um, select for them. So the environmental conditions were more conducive to them surviving. But overall, we're still hovering in that 40% range of uh, resistance. So what this means is control is, um, can be uh, problematic. So I've been asking the question, can we get a little bit of extra efficacy out of individual pyrethroids? Just because they, they exhibit resistance in general does not necessarily mean that it is equivalent resistance across all of the pyrethroids. So in 2019, we had spray trials under hot conditions, high pressure conditions. And here, um, Bathroid uh, 
perform better than some of our other pyrethroids. Here's Asana, Mustang Max, and Warrior in an adjacent block. And uh, the blue bars are the percentage of clean ears. Baythroid performed about equivalently to a Besiege uh, Warrior rotation with six applications. In our 2020 spray trials, in Georgetown, we actually had uh, unusually low um, moth counts in our, uh, our pheromone traps, at least in our traps next to the sweet corn. We did have a trap about a half mile away that was indicative of a three-day spray schedule instead of a four-day spray schedule. So this, this also goes to show that we really need to also consider what some of the local trends are. So if you have traps that are fairly close by, maybe around other blocks of sweet corn, go with the most conservative spray schedule. In 2020, um, it was also very hot, but I did not do any temperature adjusting and uh, worms just hammered the untreated check again. Um, not surprisingly, our diamide uh, applications with Besiege rotate with Warrior or Elvis rotate with Warrior provided some of the best control. This is an interesting treatment, Radiant plus Warrior, uh, looking at alternatives to Lanate plus Warrior um, from a uh, safety um, standpoint with handlers. Uh, and Radiant plus Warrior, even though this would be a pretty expensive treatment, it provides some very good efficacy. Among the pyrethroids by themselves, Baythroid was a little bit better than Brigade and Warrior. Um, statistically, they're about equivalent. Uh, so I'm just going here on uh, numeric differences only. So take that with a grain of salt. In our second spray trial, uh, the differences were a little bit more clear between Baythroid, Warrior, and Brigade. Uh, here's our Radiant plus Warrior treatment. Um, didn't quite look as good as our first spray trial, but it was still, I thought, uh, very promising. Uh, Tom Kuhar also did some pyrethroid testing. Um, in his uh, mountain test uh, at Whitehorn, Virginia, it's in Southwest Virginia in the mountains, where he had moderate to low pressure of earworms, the pyrethroids performed very well. Um, and they were all roughly equal to each other uh, with some differences between permethrin and pyganic. In, at the Eastern Shore of Virginia, under high pressure and pyrethroid resistance, the only product that worked really well was Hero, uh, but you can still see that we've got about 40% damage. Um, and then bifenthrin and baythroid performed equivalently. His best treatment, not surprisingly, was, uh, was Besiege. And that, again, goes to show that that diamide is, is critical to getting the most protection in our sweet corn plantings. Now, this is a, an interesting situation. I didn't see this in 2018 or 2019, but this past year, we had a lot of kernels that ended up looking like this when we harvested our, our plots. This is typical of hemipteran damage, such as stink bugs. And so it's something that we do uh, rate for in addition to corn earworm and fall armyworm damage. And this is where Brigade really, or the active ingredient in Brigade, uh, bifenthrin, uh, really helps. Um, here's Elevest, which is uh, the tank mix of chlorantranilaprol plus bifenthrin. And here's bifenthrin by itself. And those two, um, those two plots had the lowest amount of hemipterin damage. Hey, David. Yes. There's a question in the chat about, and I think it's probably referring to some of that Virginia data. Um, how many sprays are the product results based on? Virginia, I believe this was also six applications. I will double check, but it's it's somewhere between five and six. All right, thanks. All right, so a couple of other uh, insecticide considerations. 
in UD spray trials going back um, about 10 years, in spray trials with lanate tank mixed with pyrethroids, it is performed inconsistent in small plots. Um, sometimes the tank mix is really good. Sometimes it doesn't seem to differ and sometimes it is actually provides less protection. I suspect that if applied to larger blocks in a commercial setting, uh, it's going to uh, be more clear and probably more beneficial. Um, but it's just something that we don't quite pick up in, in small plot trials. Radiant uh, by itself is very inconsistent. It sometimes looks worse than a pyrethroid and sometimes looks good. When we tank mixed Radiant and a pyrethroid this past year, it looked very good. And uh, occasionally I get a question, should I put all of the three applications of Besiege or Corrigin up front or should I alternate them in a spray trial? Statistically, it's something that has never separated. Um, numerically, there may be a couple of percentage points in which Besiege all up front is a slightly better than Besiege alternated, uh, but I can't, I can't show that statistically. Uh, if you have sweet corn um, that is near uh, a large number of honeybees, uh, consider applying Corrigin as the first spray, particularly in low to moderate uh, worm pressure conditions. Uh, Corrigin is generally pretty good uh, by itself. And that's, that's looking at spray trial data from Virginia, from Delaware, and from New York. Though occasionally, it does not provide as good of control. And I think that's under high pressure conditions when it's applied by itself early. Um, sweet corn is highly attractive to honeybees during pollen shed. Bees collect a large amount of pollen. This block of sweet corn was about a third of a mile away from 60 beehives that were used for pollinating other crops. And you can see th there's just a tremendous number of honeybees on these tassels. So if you do need to um, go out with a, a harder spray, spray in the early afternoon or right near sundown. Sweet corn is shedding pollen early in the morning and then in the early evening hours, it'll shed a little bit more pollen and honeybees will work at right around five to probably 6.30, 7 o'clock. So what, what can we tell from uh, hindsight and particularly from 2020? Pyrethroid resistance is a major concern. Um, and we do have some regional or pressure differences in terms of efficacy. So how does this impact spray timing? That is a very open-ended question that uh, a group of entomologists, including myself, are going to be looking at in 2021. There do seem to be pyrethroid efficacy differences. At the Eastern Shore this past year, Hero is the best. In Delaware, Baythroid uh, tends to work a little bit better than the other pyrethroids. And bifenthrin is a particularly good fit, especially if you have uh, hemipterans in that planting. Uh, I've said this uh, several times, so I'm not going to stress it again. Diamides are critical. Um, if you are growing uh, BT corn, you need to treat attribute one and performance series sweet corn the same as non-BT um, because earworms are largely resistant to those groups of sweet corn plantings. Attribute two is different. It does provide 100% ear protection against corn earworm. And uh, you know, a push of mine is to look for lanate replacements, uh, more so with the uh, fresh market sweet corn um, that has more um, hand labor or more intensive uh, handler um, interaction or potential interaction. So that's what I'm looking for is uh, lanate replacements. Next year, we'll be looking at Radiant again, as well as Ryman. Want to say a couple words on hemp. Corn earworm is the major hemp pest. Um, this is something that will annihilate hemp. Hemp starts flowering in mid-September or so, right near the, the fall equinox. And 
it, when it's flowering, it's, it's both super attractive to corny orbs. They can pick it up from a long distance away. And there's not a whole lot of other attractive plants for moths to lay eggs on. And so that just, it gets very concentrated on, on hemp. And not only will it feed on the buds, but it will also cause bud rot. And you can see that in this picture right here where, where the top half of this bud is, is just rotting away. Check your state's Department of Agriculture for allowable products. Each state is, is going with a slightly different interpretation of what they should uh, allow. Delaware is following EPA's approval list strictly. And so what that means is we've got uh, virus products, BT products, a couple of other um, uh, biological insecticides and a couple of OMRI approved materials. Um, Tom Kuhar has a really good PhD student, Katie Britt, who's done a lot of spray trials and laboratory bioassays. In general, the virus products are pretty decent. Uh, you may need multiple applications because they're most effective on small worms. The BT products in his trials have not looked as good as expected by themselves, but when they're mixed with a virus product, they look very good. And uh, my other comment with these materials, Spirulep is a spider venom. It's a very large molecule. It needs to be ingested, but it doesn't actually bind to any of the, uh, the gut receptors. So it, it needs to be mixed with a BT. The BT basically opens up um, a hole for that toxin to get into the, um, the blood of the worm. Got a couple of other comments from uh, lima beans. Uh, we had uh, some soybean loopers show up in 2018 and I wanted to see what, what they would do uh, in lima beans. In soybeans, we consider them as defoliators only, but lima bean has a very different uh, pod structure than soybean. It's a little bit uh, more succulent. And loopers will eat those pods. This is something that we do not see in soybeans. Uh, so this is uh, some potted plants in the greenhouse. Um, and you can see there's a, a small looper here in the upper uh, corner here that is just going to town on this very young pod. This is not a consistent pest. It, it shows up periodically. Um, last year, we had soybean loopers show up towards the end of the, the soybean season, uh, but I was able to put out a spray trial in soybeans. And the, the best products in this trial were Radiant, Steward, and I actually had some uh, a surprising efficacy out of Hero. Uh, I'm going to put a huge asterisk by Hero. Sally Taylor at Virginia Tech uses Hero to flare up soybean loopers. So when she needs to get soybean looper data, they will spray a field in all, early to mid-August with Hero, and that actually increases the number of loopers in those sprayed plots, as opposed to uh, plots that they don't spray. Uh, soybean loopers, they're, they're just a very tough um, critter to control. Steward is um, the field crop equivalent of Avant. Um, so if you're, if you're looking at materials for lima beans for soybean loopers, that would be Avant. Uh, potato leafhopper, wanted to make one quick comment on that one. This is something that begins to migrate in late April, early May. And by late May, early June, it's building up in fairly large numbers. This picture was taken on July 9th. And you can see uh, the yellowing around the leaf margin. That's uh, uh, hopper burn. We want to avoid that. Pyrethroids are very good against uh, potato leafhopper. Uh, I've shared this slide a couple of times. I'll keep sharing it. Kent County is now under Delaware Department of Ag's spotted lanternfly quarantine zone. So if you're moving equipment or material into or out of Kent County, even, even vehicles, you'll need to check it before you leave to make sure that you're not carrying lanternflies with you. And businesses will need to uh, obtain permits, permits and training can be completed free of charge through Delaware Department of Ag's website. 
couple of quick updates on insecticides. FMC is reformulating chlorantraniloprol into a product called Vantacor. Uh, it's a much higher concentration, lower use rate, and they will be making that product available in uh, small containers, quart-sized bottles. Zeal has a label for sweet corn use now uh, against spider mites, and Corteva will not be manufacturing chlorpyrifos uh, this year. Uh, other generic manufacturers may still continue manufacturing it, but Corteva will not be. Um, the woolly worm weather prediction net is uh, calling for very confused winter conditions. And I really need to thank uh, my, my field crew, Cody Stubbs, uh, graduate student working with watermelons, uh, Joe Didesheimer, uh, who keeps everything in the lab organized and prevents the wheels from falling off, and Samantha Cotton, uh, who helped uh, extensively with data collection and field plot maintenance. Also need to thank um, agro-industry partners, FMC, Corteva, Syngenta, Bayer, and Ag Biotech, as well as uh, Friels for uh, providing some sweet corn seed this year. And with that, I'll be happy to take questions. Why do soybean loopers flare after hero application? Is it natural enemy knockdown? Yeah, in part, um, loopers are generally resistant to pyrethroids. Um, and so if we remove a lot of natural enemies like pirate bugs or big-eyed bugs or parasitic wasps, there's very little that will attack uh, those eggs and small instars. There are a ton of wasps that go after soybean loopers. In, lime, in soybeans, we typically see about 40 to 50% of our loopers parasitized with one thing or another. And when we remove all of those with uh, pyrethroids, it sets the field up. All right, thanks, David.